bed forms, uh, the three-dimensional features developed on the bottom of a moving flow are extremely important because their formation relates to specific conditions of water flow and grain size. More importantly, they leave behind sedimentary structures that we'll be able to use to infer depositional conditions in ancient environments. Uh, these slides introduce the most important types of bed forms that you'll find in unidirectional water flow. They are, of course, extremely important indicators in fluvial environments, but can form in any environment, even in the ocean, where the water flow is unidirectional. So sedimentary rocks are nearly always layered, at some scale at least. As we saw in the previous set of slides, that layering arises because of changes in the flow velocity and therefore changes in the type of sediment that it's able to transport. The thicknesses of sedimentary layers can range from millimeter scale or even less to several meters, although most are on the order of a few centimeters to maybe a meter in thickness. So that we, sub we subdivide that continuum of bed thicknesses somewhat arbitrarily into things called laminae, which are defined as being less than a centimeter thick, and beds, which are defined as being greater than a centimeter thick. Um, so, for example, rocks can be thickly laminated if the layering is between 3 and 10 millimeters, or thin bedded, or medium bedded, or etc. So, sedimentary beds can be planar, like you see in the photo on the left here, uh, which means that they have flat tops, so they might contain parallel lamination, like you see on the, the right uh, for the most part. Um, but many types of flow create three-dimensional features on the bed surface that are called bed forms. Um, bed forms are generated for a variety of reasons, but especially because of turbulent flow in the boundary layer. The boundary layer is the lower part of the flow close to the bottom. So bed forms and their resulting sedimentary structures are used as diagnostic markers of specific flow conditions. So it's really important to understand their formation in modern environments. But first, I use this term boundary layer. What is that? Um, the velocity of a flowing fluid, such as water in a river, tends to slow as it approaches a non-moving surface, such as the river bed or the river bank or, or whatever. Uh, the reason for that is that there is friction between the moving fluid and the non-moving surface. So that that depth interval, where the flow velocity is reduced relative to what's called the free stream, or the average of the, of the rest of the fluid, is called the boundary layer. Uh, you can see this quite well, especially in the figure on the right here. Uh, the de decrease in velocity is, is quite clear. Uh, velocity is, say, 80 centimeters per second or so at 7 centimeters above the bed, but only 25 to 30 at 1 centimeter above the bed and even less closer to the bed. So most boundary layers in natural flows are on the order of tens of centimeters or maybe a few meters thick, and they're mostly turbulent. Uh, so the concept of, this, of flow is a very important one, so I want to take a couple seconds to define these terms turbulent and laminar flow. So turbulent flow is one where the flow paths are highly irregular. There's lots of eddies, the water is flowing in these really complicated swirling patterns, uh, and this describes nearly all natural water flows that you probably have seen. Rivers or the ocean, they're all pretty much turbulent. Um, and turbulence is, is technically de described by a constant called the Reynolds number, which is the ratio of inertial to viscous forces in that fluid. And turbulent flows have larger Reynolds numbers. The inertial forces have to do with the movement of the water, pretty much, and so they're strongly influenced by the velocity of the flow. Uh, you can see that they're influenced by density, velocity, and depth, but really velocity is the key thing here. Um, and viscous forces are a function of the, the viscosity of the fluid, or the ease at which it flows. Just to give an example, honey is a fluid that's much more viscous than water. Honey flows really slowly, it's all, you know, all gooey, uh, but water flows very, very easily. So, because viscosity and density don't really change very much in natural water, they do change a little bit, but not a huge amount, uh, turbulence is governed primarily by the velocity of the flow. So therefore, at the very bottom of the boundary layer, in the millimeter or so above the bed, the flow velocity becomes so low that turbulence can't be, can't be maintained. 
and therefore the flow becomes something called laminar. Uh, the diagram at the bottom right illustrates laminar flow, and as the arrows suggest, it's flow that's very smooth. It doesn't have the swirling motion found in, in turbulent flows. So because of this distinction, the lowest part of the boundary layer is called the, the laminar sublayer, sometimes called the viscous sublayer, um, and the upper part, which is the vast majority of the boundary layer, is the turbulent uh, sublayer. So these two sublayers tend to or turn out to be very important because they each influence different types of bed forms. So now let's move on and talk about the bed forms themselves. So ripples are a very common type of bed form in unidirectional flow. They're quite small, they're on the order of a few centimeters tall, and they have wavelengths or spacing around say 10 or 20 centimeters. Uh, in cross-section, as you see on the right, they have a very gentle upstream slope, which is called the Stoss side, and they have a fairly steep slope on the downstream face, which is called the Lee side. If you look at a ripple from above, its crest can be fairly straight, or it can be somewhat sinuous or wavy, or it can be even curved into like a little arc shape. Uh, and the picture on the left shows some somewhat sinuous crested ripples. So ripples form because of erosion on this shallowly sloping Stoss side, or upstream side of the ripple. Uh, in the diagram, the flowing water path, which, is the, which are the dashed arrows, um, you can see it kind of detaches from the sediment at the very crest of the ripple, at this brink point, uh, and then it reattaches at, the, at some point along the Stoss side. So where it reattaches, that the laminar sublayer of the boundary layer becomes compressed. It becomes thinner, and so thinner flow leads to higher velocity, and as you learned in the previous lecture, higher velocity is more able to erode and to transport sediment. There's this eddy in the trough, kind of a backwater, where the water just swirls around slowly, um, and that slower velocity in the, in the lee face leads to deposition. So because of this pattern of erosion on the Stoss side and deposition on the lee side face, ripples migrate downstream, which would be from left to, to right in this diagram. The other really common type of bed form is called a dune. Dunes look kind of like giant ripples. In that they have a gentle upstream Stoss slope and a steep downstream lee side. Uh, but the height of dunes is typically tens of centimeters. They can, in unusual circumstances, reach meters in height if the flow is quite deep. Um, and their spacing is on the order of a few meters. Maybe it can be tens of meters or even hundreds of meters. Um, dunes, like ripples, migrate in the downstream direction because there is erosion on the Stoss side and deposition on the leaf face. So in these photos, I've, I've kind of marked the, dune, the lee faces of these big dunes with some, some red arrows. And actually, in both of the pictures, especially in the left-hand picture, the dunes have ripples superimposed on their surfaces. So are dunes just ripples that get really big? Well, despite their similarities, dunes and ripples form in fundamentally different ways. Dunes form from large-scale turbulence in the turbulent sublayer of the boundary layer, but ripples are related to variations within the laminar sublayer. The two bed forms also scale differently. The size and spacing of dunes is related to the flow depth, and so they both increase as the flow gets deeper. But ripple size is independent of the flow depth. Instead, ripples get bigger when the grain size gets bigger. Uh, there also seems to be two peaks in the distribution of height or spacing. You have one peak at smaller sizes or wavelengths for ripples, and then a gap, and then another kind of broader peak for dunes at larger sizes. So we mentioned before how bedding can be planar, have, have flat layering, um, but there's a special case of planar bedding called upper plane bed. Uh, this produces parallel laminations. You can see the thinly spaced horizontal layering uh, in the left-hand photo, which is really defined best by these dark layers of, of heavy minerals. 
Uh, if you looked at the surface of one of those layers, you would see faint ridges and grooves that run parallel to the flow direction along the surface of the bed. In the right-hand picture, they're running vertically. Um, these, these faint ridges and grooves are called parting lineations. And they are really important for distinguishing upper plane bed from just regular plane bedding, which is sometimes called lower plane bed. So the formation of these parting lineations is actually a pretty cool phenomenon. Um, remember that the boundary layer has a turbulent layer, which has lots of, of swirls and eddies and mixing. Um, but they can become organized into these streaks of faster and slower flow. A little animation on the left kind of shows the streakiness of, of water flow. So when one of those turbulent bursts of flow gets close to the bottom, it can kind of swirl up into a very a fast little burst, and therefore, because it's moving more quickly, it will erode away a little bit of a, a little streak of sediment there. Uh, so that leaves a thin groove in the sediment, and there's the ridges are the sediment that remains between these streaks. Remember that the faster flow in this in the in these bursting streaks will erode sediment. And the, and the comparatively slower flow next to it will be unable to move some of that sediment. So the final unidirectional bed form is the anti-dune. It's actually a pretty unusual bed form, at least in typical river flows, because it requires something called supercritical flow. I'll explain what that is on the, on the next slide. Um, because it requires supercritical flow, the anti-dune might be reworked in to different bed forms when the water stops being supercritical. So an anti-dune is a broad and slightly asymmetrical bed form, as you can see in the lower left photo. They actually migrate upstream, in, in most cases at least, which is unusual as we've seen compared to ripples and dunes, both of which migrate downstream. Uh, the picture on the right shows anti-dunes, or at least it shows the standing waves that are above where the anti-dune would be located. So what is supercritical flow, and, and why do I have a picture of a kitchen sink here? Well, the, the criticality of, of flowing water is measured by something called the Froud number. The Froud number is simply the flow velocity, again, remember that's u, um, divided by the speed at which a wave can move through the water. That's called wave celerity. And celerity comes from the same root as like acceleration, not like the vegetable celery. In the case of shallow water, wave celerity, the speed at which the wave can move, um, is simply the square root of gravity times the water depth. In any case, if the fruit number is less than one, the water flow is called subcritical. And I kind of highlighted that over there. That's the outer areas of the sink where there's kind of waves on the surface. If the fruit number is greater than one, so if the speed of the water flow is faster than the speed at which waves can move through that water, it's called supercritical. And in this, er this uh, example here, this picture, the supercritical flow area has a very smooth surface because the water is moving faster than the waves can, so the waves are unable to move into that area. The boundary between the supercritical and the subcritical flow is called a, a hydraulic jump, located approximately here. So supercritical flows have somewhat unique properties that lead to the formation of these anti-dunes. In normal subcritical flow, the water surface is out of phase with the bed. You can see in the diagram that when the bed uh, has a crest or a peak, the water surface actually has a trough or a low point, and vice versa. What that does is that tends to compress the water over the cr dune crest, which leads to faster flow, and therefore to higher shear stress or forces, and therefore erosion. The lower velocity area has lower shear stress from the moving water, and therefore deposition. In supercritical flow, however, the water surface is actually in phase with the bed, so therefore crests in the bed line up with crests in the water surface. You can actually see that in the previous, um, in the in the picture in the previous slide of the anti-dune, how the water surface is in phase with the, with the bed. So what that means is that the water is actually compressed and therefore faster in the troughs, which leads to erosion in that area, and slower and therefore 
lower shear stress leading to deposition on the crest. Because of this, this ultimately causes upstream migration of the antidote.